little overkill to 64. Maybe the values have to be unique? Ooh. That was interesting that I hit a fall through. But yeah, I, I would expect to see, if I can invalidate caches and I see everything every time, then I would thus expect that if I invalidate a specific set, it would behave similarly to if I were to evict all the sets. Um, and let's see, if I were to do, if I were to evict just all of RAM, perform this operation, or not all of RAM, but a large amount of RAM, I should see everything. This should behave identically. This should behave identically to invalidating all caches. And there it starts happening. Like it takes a while and then it happens. Let's see if that happens again. Like right off the bat, it's only the odds and then it starts filling in all of them. You know what? I think that has to do with Maybe, yeah, I think it might be like the hyper-threading boundaries. So let's see if I can do every other set. So if I were to step by 128, um, like stepping by 64 should be identical. Stepping by this, okay, that's giving me a... Now I'm seeing basically everything, and then I eventually get one of those. I'm going to hide these temporarily. And uh, step by 64. Step by 128. I'm going to step by 512. And everything starts showing up. Hmm. Step by 4096. Now we should only be doing one of the sets. And we're seeing everything. What? If I get rid of this, do we see everything still? Or is this like a temporary weird thingy? Evens, evens. I guess I can let this run a little bit longer. Okay, so that's that seems to be doing evens this whole time. Now this one is odds. I don't know why. And let's throw in the read. I think only the read's required, not the write. And there everything is. But for the very first run, that wasn't the case. Um, so... If I do eight... Wow. So this one does not end up with everything. Uh, and let's do eight times eight. 64. I'm curious if the C0 will show up in this one. No. What? FF is showing up. I guess FF is normal. Uh, 256. I think this is the one where everything is printing out. What are you doing? I'm trying to learn how uh, CPU works kind of behind the scenes for this new CPU bug. Okay. Where are all the prints? Not seeing everything. So I'm not evicting thoroughly enough, in my opinion. 
There we go. 512. Does not do it. But 1024 seems to do it. For some reason, 4 megs seems to show us everything. Which is interesting because I, I don't know why this would change how that behaves. We're potentially pushing things out of L3 at this point, but I don't know why that would mean that the other sets are now visible. Like, we can see all the sets now. Although they are at kind of different rates. So here come all the sets. And now let's see if they come back. So some are in the 300s and some are in the 1000s. And there they just came in again. They seem to come in bursts. It seems to be kind of an either or. Which is really strange. <laughs> that is so weird. That is so weird. Evict all those sets. Wait for them to be filled in. Uh, I can try a delay again. That'll give them time. We'll do like, I don't know, 5,000. Fuck it, 10,000, who cares? Give some time for the other thread to do some stuff and, and pull those through. You know, there are only 10 of those entries. There are only 10 of the LFBs, and we're probably not randomly sampling them due to the scheduling and like decisions that the processor makes on when to uh, switch hyper threads. So I feel like it might not be accurate uh, to be doing the random or the sequential reads like we're doing now. Honestly, random reads would actually probably be better. But let's take a look at this one. So C2, yep. 100% leak rate on C2, and let's see what happens if I get rid of this read. I'll just get rid of this entirely. Unless it's the iterator. Like, is the iterator doing something stupid? There's C2, 100%. That iterator should get optimized out. It shouldn't. It shouldn't even exist. C2, 96%. So up here, we're just reading the same address over and over in a loop. Perfect. Can't get any simpler than that. Here, we're going to try to evict. We're going to perform these reads. Here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to check this in. Git commit am interesting. Uh, cash out and I'm gonna change this to not do the prime and probe of as many buffers as it's using so I'm going to try to turn down a lot of the noise that is generated by the leaking itself I'm gonna try and get this environment as quiet as possible because right now I don't trust uh, my measurement tools and if I don't trust my measurement tools I can't really perform research uh, so Let's see what I can do. I've, I can basically isolate everything out. Uh, we're going to get rid of these timing buffers. We might just rewrite basically everything here uh, to a large extent. Comment that out. Cool. Get rid of these M fence and those. Get rid of this. I don't care about that stat. I'm going to put an int 3 in here because I never want that to happen. 
It's not passing through this R15, which is a stack. Uh, leaked entries. Okay. Here we're going to do a time access. We don't want to do this timing buffer. I'm going to get rid of, like, basically everything. Threshold we still want. We want eviction to be zeroed out. Uh, the leak source and whatever, we can just use the stack. Um... Leak sources at that, aborts, the leak frequencies, and leaked bytes. So we're going to do uh, cool. Then we're going to get rid of all this shit for now. We're going to have the leak source, which we need to make. So we need to make uh, let leak source is equal to vec allocate a page cool so you have a leak source and then the timing buffer is actually going to be binary we're going to have a timing buffer here and this is just going to be two pages uh then i'm going to switch this logic and i'm going to do a zor edi edi uh we have no clobbers we have RSI and RDI. That's all we need. We need the timing buffer passed in, and we need that. So we're going to XOR EDI EDI. I'm going to do a compare with uh, of AL with OX. D9 is going to be our leak value. And then I'm going to do a uh, uh, set equal of DIL. Um, I can actually use, I'm going to use EDX, that's what I meant to use. Uh, so now I got DL, set equal on DL, and then I'm going to shift left EDX by 12. So effectively, this logic right here is if leaked byte is equal to OXD9, then RDX is equal to 4096 else rdx is equal to zero and then we're going to read rsi deref rdx and that will be our probe and then we only have to time one entry so we're going to time the access to the timing buffer 4096 and if it's less than the threshold then print, uh, we're going to do leaked plus equals one. Get rid of all this shit. RDTSC is fine. Get rid of the store. And at the very start, we just have to do a CL flush on this address. That's it. So we're going to do CL flush of a fixed address. In fact, I can even do it here. I'm going to do a CL flush of RSI plus 4096. Very predictable. Got our X begin. We're going to do our attack here. X or EDX, EDX. Compare AL with D9. If it's equal, then we're going to set DL. And then we're going to shift left EDX by 12. And we're going to deref uh, RSI plus RDX into racks. Now, XN will have an int 3 here. If we fall through, everything's marked volatile. We're going to time the access to the second part of this, and then we'll track leaked. Uh, let mute leaked is equal to 0u64. And then here, I can print, print leaked this of this leaked attempt. Can't get much simpler than that. And I'm not leaking D9 right now. Exception 3, I'm going to have to figure out some of these new timings. Maybe two of those will do. i got to find that right window. Perfect. Perfect. Zero leaks. That's what I like to see. And we're doing a shit ton of attempts per second. So we're really focused in on this now. 
Uh, so let's take a look here. Uh, I want to write a value. I'm going to write OXD9. Uh, fuck it. C0 includes D9. Uh, what is that? If I do... Uh, st stream term python oxd9 minus oxc0 uh, hex d9 minus c0 shift to the left by 6 640 so for us to see our leak we want to cause an eviction of the 640 set Right now, we're seeing no leaks. Perfect. 0% out of millions. Like, we're doing shit tons. We're doing, like, what, 3 million a second? Uh, yeah, like 4 million leaks a second. And we're getting nothing. No signal. Perfect. That's what I like to see. Just whisper quiet. Okay, so that means I can come in here and I can try to start causing some evictions. So, I'm going to go through my eviction, and I'm going to do four, four offset in uh, zero dot dot evict dot len, uh, four offset in zero evict length, I want to do a, uh, and I want to step by 4096. Actually, I'm going to do for this in 8. I'm going to do a core pointer read volatile of evict.aspointer.offset offset times 4096. That's really simple. That'll compile down. And okay. So this, we should have no signal still. Perfect. We have nothing. And let's see if we change this to C0, if we have signal now. Nothing. Okay. Um, so let's do a CPU. Let's make sure that our leak is still working. Interesting. Uh, oh, we're leaking only 80. If we do this, this should, God, please, this should work. Really? That should be C0. That should be reading C0. Uh, I'm going to add a right volatile of OXC0. I guess we might have broken something about the leak. Uh, leaked that. Maybe it doesn't like that DL. I'm gonna just load AL directly for this attack. Let's see. Uh, making runes. No, nothing. EDX, EDX, XORD, compare with C0. I'm going to set any just to make sure this works. This should work. Beautiful. Interesting. What? If I do set not equal, it's not 100%, which means sometimes it is equal. Uh, I'm going to clear out this cache line. Clear out both of those timing ones. That will make it behave the same in both cases. Wow. Uh, let me mfence here. 
Well, I'm writing back and validating caches. Okay. So that breaks it. That is bizarre. Do I need to have this RDI be one of the first ones? Because I think I need to have the... Okay, that's good. I'm gonna do this. I just need to find the right feng shui. I'm pretty sure here it's a timing thing. Because I need that, I need that fault to come through at the right time. On uh, here I can do a move racks zero. These seem to kind of help before, I'm not sure why. And we'll just see. Okay, leaked. Right back and validate caches. This one's reading in a hot loop. Let's just do two reads in a loop. That should be reading C0. Nothing. That's so bizarre. So if I do set not equal. That's so weird. I'm gonna load racks. I don't know, like. What the fuck? If I clear both of those, I can. I can time the zeroth. And now this will tell me my leak rate, technically, which is weird. Zero. Uh, this should be 100%, right? One of those cache lines should get touched. It's not. So sometimes the leak is not occurring. And that must be a timing issue then. Sometimes the execution is not making it to this. Oh, I need to, uh, I think I need to warm these up. Here we go. Move racks RSI plus zero, uh, 4096 and make racks a clobber now. So those will now be fresh in the, in the TLBs. This might do the trick. Oh, unrecognized option. Yep. What the hell? That's really strange. Oh, uh, I can comment this out temporarily. But for some reason, this leak primitive is not working the same as the other one. And I think it might be... Well, that died. Um, the other one was interesting because it would abort. Because we'd get we'd get two values loaded in one execution, and I think the issue here is we can only get one. And I think the processor is getting really confused. Like if we made this load succeed, if we got rid of these CL flushes, we're gonna hit our int three. I'm gonna get rid of the int three. We should always, we should see the leaked should be 100%. Because one of those is always gonna get hit. Okay, we see double. 
Oh, uh, let me see if I'm hitting that in three. Actually, double is what I want to see. Now we're hitting in three. So time the zero, time the 4,096. Oh, I need to have these flushes in. Okay. And I'll throw in an M fence. And I gotta get rid of the int three. But this, the number should be the same. Only one of those should ever be pulled in L and cash per run. There we go. Cool. That's what I expect. Uh, so now if I put in my int three, so this is behaving as I want. Um, now we're getting that in three issue, so I have to do a seal flush, and I have to get the timing right on that seal flush. I'm curious if I can put a delay in here. So I know if I do, like, an RSI flush, this can kind of set up the timing perfectly. Uh, I think I need to do probably another one of these, two RSIs and an RDI. This is kind of what was the magic mix before. Not quite. I think the RDI might have to be the first one. Because the... Hmm. Nope. Uh, honestly, let's, let's just add more. I need those seal flushes to happen, like, while this is occurring and let's I think what I need to do is I need to figure out how to get this perfect so what can I do here uh, I'm gonna hit the int 3 in this case I need to figure out the right delay between the seal flush and this X begin to get the leak occurring a hundred percent of the time that's that's what I need to see That's what I need to see. So, what's the best way to go about that then? I could... I think I'm going to add random delays, but I might need to graph that out. That's fine. So, I've got the M fence, and I'm going to also serialize here. I'm going to move into CR2 racks. Uh, actually... Uh, is that what I do for my, that's n no way. Source. Oh yeah, I can do that. CR2 is the Fulting address. Yeah, that has no effect. Uh, okay. Cool. So that M fences and this serializes the instruction stream. And then here we're going to uh, seal flush RDI. And I need to basically keep playing around with delays here until I find the right window. So let's do a uh, let failure, and we'll do failure into uh, R15, failure, oops, uh, and we'll do, oops, let's see. Okay. So we have we have failure here, and I'm gonna write into R15 or R15. I'm just gonna store a one. That's the failure, and I'll mark that as a bool. Actually, uh, U64 because I don't know the sizing. And then a jump 3F3, move R15, 0. Okay. So I should have a failure indicator now. I have right back and validate. So we'll do, I'm just going to do this just to make sure that that is working. It should just always be 1. But that'll basically indicate if we were to fall through 1, 1. Okay, those numbers match. 
which is good. So then what I want to do, set equal, yeah. Oh, and I'm actually going to throw an M fence back here at the end. Because at the end, it shouldn't matter at all. That'll just make sure that the loads uh, definitely have occurred. So the leak numbers matching right now is really good. Um, and I should never see a leak, I don't think. Uh, I'm going to do a panic. Whoa. In that case. And that will happen basically if we're able to leak that value. And yeah, we're not seeing it. We're seeing all of them missing right now, which is great. We're CL flushing those. And now I just need to get the timing set up right here. Uh, so I'm going to do a delay here, which is going to be random. Uh... I'm going to do it before this M fence and serialization barrier. So we'll do uh, RD Rand into racks. Move CR2 racks. That actually works great. And then I'm going to, I'm actually going to and racks with OXFFF. Uh, and then here, let's add a spin loop of four deck racks, J and Z. Uh, for B and then we have to add racks one Okay, so we're gonna seal flush and then we're gonna delay for up to 4,000 cycles and then we're gonna do all this and uh, I'm going to assert Assert failure is equal to one we always want to fail Well, we don't want to we want this assertion to fail at some point Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Son of a bitch. Uh, let's get rid of the write back and validate. So we're doing more attempts. And let's up the delay potential. But it might have to do with the uh, activity on load ports. It might not be delay based. I was hoping it would be delay based. Because I can do delays all day long. Uh, RSI, actually we'll do RSI plus zero, RSI plus 4,096. And yeah, we can have a chance of zero delay. Let's make sure... Uh, Jump 3F, 2F is if there was an abort. So for some reason, we're not getting aborts here. Uh, let's repeat these a couple times. I just need to find that right mix. I just kind of lucked into it before. We'll throw a couple more loads in here, just all over the place. Get some of those load ports busy. Um, what happened here? Oh, yeah, the, or clobbering this. RBX, RBX, do some of these. And mark RBX as a clobber. There we go. It doesn't seem to be a random delay. Uh, what if I put this beforehand and get rid of some of these loads? Maybe it's a delay beforehand to get the right speculation barrier. Bam. Bam, 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 bam. Fuck yeah. Okay. It's totally that. Nice, 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 nice. Uh, and let's uh, let's get a print of the. Uh, I think I can do this. Uh, I don't know if my kernel supports assertions of this format, and it does. Okay, so I'm gonna print uh, CPU read CR2. This is gonna tell me the uh, cycle count that it used to delay, and it might just be like nothing. Uh, 41516. OK, 
Okay, does it not matter? Let's see if I drop it down to 256 maximum, if this still works. Does, 101. Do I just need to do like one branch? Do I need to perform a single branch? Move racks one. Is that it? One branch to rule them all? No. Uh, we did eventually hit it. Uh, okay, 10. 10 branches. Cool. Uh, let's get rid of the Artie Rand. The seal flushes, so, yeah. Pull it in, flush, pull it in, flush. M fence, uh, serialization barrier. And let's get rid of these seal flushes, because I don't want them. I want this as quiet as I can get. Beautiful. Uh, of course, there's no CR2 anymore, and then... Uh, what I want to do is let mute failures is equal to 0 u64 and failures plus equals failure and we'll do failures. I want that to be a hundred percent success rate. I think we'll get it. I think yeah just having a, a little bit of a delay there. whoa. Whoa! Oh, we had a leak! Okay. Let's see what we get now. I think we're getting here, man. We're learning. We're learning a shit ton. Are these numbers the same? I think they should be. Leaked attempts. Uh, oh, are there failures? Oh, there are failures. This plus this should be equal to that. Okay, let's add a delay of 30 cycles. I'm just going to keep doing this until the failure rate goes to zero. Um, really? 300? Got to make runes. Still failures. That's interesting. I don't know what causes those. Uh, we're not getting a 100% failure rate. If I don't have this loop, I think the failure rate goes to 100%, if I'm not mistaken. So let's see what we get. Um, no, it's not. What? Oh, I'm going to change this to this. This is actual the the C0 leaks. So we are getting C0 leaks now. And let me change this to C1, which I don't think we should be getting. We shouldn't get C1. So I'm just going to make sure there aren't false positives here. But there shouldn't be. Zero. Perfect. Okay, so this attack is working. Uh, we don't have 100% reliability yet on this delay. So I need to figure out... I could do a, a flush of RSI shortly after with the delay. That seemed to put a, uh, it's still about a 50-50 failure rate, which is interesting. When I see 50-50, I kind of assume Uh, okay, that hurt, that hurt the success rate. Um, RSI, RSI, RDI.
Beautiful. I don't know why, but that works. Uh, and let's up this delay. Uh, let's try actually plus 4096. So it's just about it's just about finding this right timing. That hurt it. Wow. What if I do three seal flushes? Oh man, this is finicky. Zero. Do I need this delay anymore? I am glad that I have an M fence in here now. M fences make me happy. M fences to me are like determinism barriers. Okay, I don't need this delay. This is the magic sequence uh, for some reason. I have no idea why, but it is. We got an M fence at the end. We've got these. I'm going to go back to an int three. Uh, so we're going to have a two. We're going to have an int three. We can get rid of the RBX. The RBX clobber we don't have anymore. And R15, we're not tracking failures anymore. And we're going to get rid of this, and this, and the failure counter. That's, uh, and we can get rid of this failure here. And we need another, we did this last time. Yep, there we go. Okay, so now the int 3 is the failure. Nice. No failures anymore. And the leaks are looking good, so if we set this to C0, we should now see leaks. Oh my god. Really? Do we need a delay? Move racks. Move racks. 100. 3. Deck racks. J and Z 3. B. Um... Well, we might be doing some undos in a second here. Wow, nothing. Uh, unless it's the failure tracking stuff, but I don't think that would have an effect. Uh, let's write back and validate. Wow, really? Uh, okay, what did I have that leaked? When I changed it to C1. Where was that? Right there. This should work. This we should be able to see leaks. Yep, leaked. Certain percentage of the time, we are flushing those. And then when we change this to a C1, we saw the leaks go away, which is good. Right? Leaks go away. And then I'm going to go back up to the top, and I'm going to change this to use offset 40, which would then put it in the C1 territory again. And I would like for this to show leaks again. Yes. Okay, so interesting. Is that number identical to the failures, or is that just coincidence? Do we have a failure when we don't leak? So do I want failures? If I put this back to zero, 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 I get no leaks, but the same amount of failures. Everything, all the metrics are the same, but the leaks go away. Okay, perfect. Uh, I don't know how I'm getting those leaks without evicting. 
those sets. It's kind of the same problem I had before. So we don't need to time that anymore. And we just got failures. So we're tracking failures and the leaks. And hopefully that didn't break anything. It did not. So we've got uh, failures. 10, 10, 10. Put a new line in here. OK. So the print shouldn't really be affecting anything. Uh, I don't know how I'm reading the C0s, though. I'm kind of surprised. Uh, so I have those failures. The leak does seem to be working. I feel like I'm not causing the same evictions that I was before, which is weird. Um, yeah, I'm not doing evictions. The right to CR2 shouldn't do anything. Those shouldn't. Doing one CL flush. We don't need this delay. We perform one of these. We compare with C1. Set if it's equal. RDI is valid and mapped. And then we load based on RDX to probe one of these two to determine what, what we got. Uh, I'm... Leaked failures. And then setting this to C1, the 80, seems to do the trick. And I don't know how evictions are happening here. I really don't. Oh, now I'm not getting it. Wait, uh, 40 is C1. Whew. Yep. So I think I have like a 100% leak rate. I think the failures are actually taking away I'm leaking, yeah, I, th I think I'm leaking 100% of the time. Now I'm getting a shit ton of failures. RSI first. But like the leak stops working if I get rid of the failures. I think this one, this combination gets rid of the failures. And for some reason, this causes, yeah, so there are no failures, but we're also not leaking ever. Uh, what if I flush something else? I'll flush the stack. That is bizarre. If I do RDI plus 4096, even like RDI plus a, a smaller number. Uh, yep, that's an exception. Page fault. And then we see the leaks. But it's interesting that every time that we succeed, right, if I do Python, this number, subtract the failures is equal to our leaks. We're leaking 100% of the time. Yeah, we're leaking 100% of the time when we're not having a failure. And if I get rid of these, this M fence and the CR2. Same thing.
I know it. I know it's possible to get this to 100. percent I honestly have no idea how how we're causing the evictions of the other thread. We're only performing one timing access. I, I, I don't know how we're even seeing that C1 value. C3, that'll be, uh, C3 will be C0. So let's see. We should see no leaks and we don't, we see nothing. But then if I change this to read C0, I'll start seeing those. Ooh. So we leaked every time there's a failure in this? Huh, let's run it again. Oh my God, that is so weird. What is changing between these runs? Leaked. That percent out of those. What on earth? What? All right, let's do this one. Where we randomly, we randomly pick the lines that we're reading from. Let's see how often we see leaks. Okay. Uh, that's really bad. And then this one, 3,000 per. Zero. God, where am I getting all this noise from? If I do this, it's probably going to be relatively deterministic. If I flush those caches, I'm not getting any leaks. What? I guess it's many fewer attempts. That's fair. Failures, very few failures. And then if I were to have this not randomly pick and just be OXC zero, then I think we'll see the signal jump. Zero failures, but zero leaks. What am I trying to leak, C3? That is C1, yeah, that should be this one, uh, unless it's a delay, but we've tried these delays and they haven't done anything for us. Nothing, no failures either. Throw on the fence and the serialization. Now they're always failing. Okay, cool. Uh, let's grab an RSI. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm going to need to change my kernel and make the like allocations 100% deterministic. Like I want to be able to boot my OS and get the exact same page table mappings and virtual, virtual addresses and page table entries 
and the physical addresses for this page table entries every single boot. Because uh, right now I'm, I don't like that I'm getting different results each run. Uh, that really concerns me. Like it, it just hasn't been isolated. So here we have, here we have successful leaks, without the write back and validate. Which is weird. It's almost as if the write back is actually hurting us. But it wasn't like that for the other proof of concept. That's I guess that's causing a failure every time. Causing a different access pattern. Okay, so let's try this. Let's see what this... This is like 50-50. Success, fail. Failures, plus equals failure. It is basically like 50-50, which is really weird. Okay, let me do this. Uh, let's evict. Let's evict from one of these sets. This is the C0 set. Um, 906, okay, and now I can go, now we're into the C0s, we're doing 8, oh, we're doing a shit ton of accesses, oh, we're do only doing 8 right now, we allocate a lot more, uh, Vict is C0, and okay, that's about the same. So I just I just don't know what's causing those to get evicted. I don't know why these would be getting line fill buffers. I mean, maybe I should try a different address. Maybe maybe I'll just do this address. Like is that for some reason MMIO space and it's like uncached? No. Read volatile, get rid of one of those reads. If I go to 100, this is now C4, and we hopefully won't see any leaks. Yeah. What the fuck? I don't know what's causing those evictions. I don't know what's causing line fill buffer entries to get allocated. Maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe this this isn't just line fill buffers. Yeah. I think I need perfect modeling of L1 cache. I need to understand that better. I don't... Yeah, so like there's, there's the leaks again, no surprise. Um, uh, what the fuck? X or EDX, EDX, leak that. Is it coming from here? That would that would make no sense. This is a four K line. This is four K aligned. All these are four K aligned. Uh, let's get rid of these axes. Just in case. Okay. And I'll nuke the M fence. This might drop failures to zero. No. I just don't know how these are getting line fill buffer entries. I'm gonna comment this out. I'm gonna see if we still get it. Yeah, fuck, Pixie just died, didn't it? 
Yep, too many open files. All right, I got to reboot that server then. Uh, remote control, power control, reset server. Boom, gone. Okay, reset. All right, so we have to wait for that to come up. That's going to take a little bit of a, a time for that to fully reboot. Base mask, I'm going to write all those values. And in this case, we shouldn't see it because I'm not going to be doing the read in the loop. So I would expect in this case, yeah, we're not going to see any signal. We'll see the same like half the, half the time we're going to see failures, uh, which I still don't really understand why it's half the time. Uh, maybe I need to do two loads. What if I do two loads and or them? What if I do two loads and pick the one that isn't the one that's the wrong one? That could be next level. I could perform two loads and... Okay, here we go. We're back. All right, leak zero. Okay, so that is when we do, when we're not loading in a loop. And then we'll load in a loop, and we should see the leak rate will go through the roof, and the failure rate will look about the same. 586, 346 in the first iteration. Okay, that looks awesome. And then I'm going to do this. I'm going to CPU halt. I'm going to do a couple loads. Let's just do 10,000. We'll do a couple loads and then we'll stop loading. And we're going to see if we still get leaks. We never get anything. So I, I kind of want to see the leaks coming in and then stop based on that loop ending. Uh, we'll do like 2 billion. That's probably like five seconds of loads. So we should see a couple succeed. Yep, leak, and then it stops. So though I'm definitely leaking those loads. Those are absolutely the loads I'm leaking. 148553. I don't know how those are getting LFB entries. I really don't know if this bug actually is caught, like, why would there be a line fill buffer entry? There's just not enough code here to cause evictions of those. I guess I'm doing the evictions here. Let me uh, get rid of these. Don't need the delay. And... Yeah. There we see it, and it stops. Oh, the failures also stop? Whoa. Whoa. What? I guess that, that TSX section is being like influenced by this one pretty dramatically. I'm going to go to 10 million, see if we get a couple more seconds. Uh... Yep, it's going up, going up, and then it stops, and failure stops as well. Which, to me, that would indicate... Is the act of taking a TSX region causing an eviction of that cache line, which is causing an LFB to get filled? That is insane. I...
like I'm doing reads in the other thread. Are one of these CL flushes causing the cash line to be flushed of what we're attacking on accident somehow? That makes no sense. Uh, time access pointer. If time access pointer, uh, let's get the threshold in here. If the time access of this pointer is less than the threshold, or is greater than or equal to thresh, uh, prints eviction, we're gonna panic. Leak zero, time access, pointer. Well, now I'm, not <laughs> now I'm not hitting it. What? Uh, time access should cause an access of that for sure. Uh, VSP source CPU research helpers. Time access, M fence, RDTSC, read volatile of the buffer, M fence, RDTSC. I guess maybe that widens the window too much. Core pointer, read volatile pointer. No leaks. Oh, I have this. Uh, let's get rid of this shit. We don't need this. Failures. Failures stay stagnant. So timing the axis of this breaks it. Oh, I hate when that happens, man. I hate when you can't, like, time things because it break. Yeah, there's the leaks. Does just doing an M fence break it? Soding, man. Damn, big raid. What is up? Holy shit. How's it going? All right, we got this M fence. PHP. PHP raid. <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. Oh, jeez. PHP is the new rust. Yeah, I'm going to pour all my stuff. I'm going to pour everything I have. I'm going to switch right over to PHP. I don't even know the last time I wrote PHP. Okay, so M fence breaks it. And M fence over here breaks it. What? How does that even happen? Two loads. Let's see if I do two loads and an M fence. We're going to have to find the right sandwich of like fences and things. Dear Lord, my eyes. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're doing some weird shit. Thank you, everyone, for the follows. Welcome to the... Ooh! Ooh! It's not zero! The leak rate's not zero! With an M-fence. Two loads and an M-fence. We can, we can make that work. That means we might be able to time it if we do two loads. <laughs> Epic Hacker Man Colors. Theme's actually amazing. It's just the default theme. 
to be to be honest. Thank you so much for the follows. It's just the default. Uh, the def oh whoa, now it's not working. Oh one win leak. One leak to rule them all. Three leaks. Five leaks. That is so strange. I just want to be able to time this access. I want to see if that's getting evicted. Maybe I can use some other leaked. Ah. Uh, maybe I'll put maybe I'll put a load sandwich in here. We'll do this. Two loads. Two loads and a sandwich. And then maybe that allows us to get by with the M fences. <laughs> I'm leaking. <laughs> Just let it leak. <laughs> yeah, so to everyone who's come over, uh, like two or three days ago, there's a new CPU bug that came out uh, that's been named Cash Out. And debatably, it's a new CPU bug. Debatably, it's more of a, a, a different spin on a kind of known thing that was actually kind of uh, referenced in one of the older papers that came out uh, in May of last year from the MDS vulnerabilities. So effectively, uh, this vulnerability relies on uh, some microarchitectural things that allow you to leak information that you're not supposed to be able to leak on Intel processors. Uh, and uh, effectively, the way all, all of this shit works at the end of the day is the processor is doing things out of order. It's it's trying to do things before it knows whether or not it actually succeeded in prior things. So for example, the processor might dispatch a load and it might try to figure out uh, what is going on. Uh, or it might dispatch a load and then it might go ahead and start executing instructions that aren't depending on the result of that load. And then it finds out a few cycles later, like microseconds later, nanoseconds later, to be honest, uh, it finds out that that load was invalid and it faulted. And the processor needs to go back and it needs to undo all of these things that it did based on this speculation, this, this attempt at trying something with the hopes that it was correct. Uh, so this has led to a lot of different vulnerabilities in specifically Intel processors, but have affected some other ones. Uh, and they started... Uh, about two years ago, or three years ago, two years ago, uh, with like Spectre and Meltdown, and you might see, might have seen those names before, Spectre and Meltdown, and those referred to some of the first bugs uh, of this class that kind of got everyone looking in this direction. These out of order execution, uh, speculative execution bugs, uh, mainly in Intel processors that people have been focusing at, and they also kind of have had the most issues. So this cash out attack came out and effectively uh, the TLDR, so this series that I do is called paper review where I will look through a paper, we'll read through it, I'll critique it. I'm not an academic so I like to critique some of the things that try to sound novel and talk about how the world is ending and how this paper has solved all the problems. So I like to kind of nitpick and talk about things that bother me uh, through the wording and presentation, but also going into the technical details. And so far, this is the second episode. And yeah, we're in the middle of writing a POC and trying to understand exactly how this bug works to a deeper level uh, than this paper. So yeah, these have been, uh, these have been pretty crazy. Daniel is also part of Spectre. How do you rate this paper so far? Um, honestly, not too highly. Uh, I think the paper is, uh, it, it was something that I, I kind of screamed about like five hours ago when I was trying to figure some stuff out. This paper um, doesn't go into the level of detail that is required to duplicate the results. Uh, and I think they are relied, uh, relying on system noise, other things, and art, like artifacts from other things going on in the system, their specific setup, uh, but they aren't going through and describing how they set these environments up. For example, the only code samples they give are these very rudimentary samples without any context of which 
how much CPU load there is while these are running, uh, what features have been turned on and off on the processor, turbo boosting, hyper threading. Uh, uh, well, they go through hyper threading, uh, turbo boosting, and uh, uh, the scaling, the downscaling, downclocking, speed step. Um, and a bunch of other things that kind of can affect the ability of reproducing these results. And I've been able to reproduce the results uh, relatively well in a couple of scenarios. Uh, however, I still don't have a full understanding of the ramifications of this bug. And I don't care about getting a POC that kind of works in a similar way. And I would say that is one issue I have with a lot of these academic papers uh, of these CPU bugs. They typically talk about what specifically, uh, like, like what they did to get some percentage of, of signal. So let's, let's say, for example, they go through and, and talk about these success rates. And they have like a 5% sec success rate here, 1% here, 2% here in that ballpark. I don't like under 100% success rates. Because in my opinion... If you don't have a 100% success rate, you haven't figured out what is actually happening yet. It's not too difficult to reproduce results when you're looking for these success rates that are basically just noise. You're trying to get some random hit every once in a while out of noise. And they do have these really good like same thread reads and writes that look like very uh, solid data where it is sequentially going through and it's seeing that information. Uh, but I'm struggling to reproduce it to this level of control. And also, this indicates a much stronger uh, like success rate than I think these graphs do. So I'm not 100% sure uh, what they're trying to show here, uh, to be honest. But nevertheless, uh, I think... In terms of what this bug is, I think it's relatively good. I think there's a lot of repetition in this paper, and I think the paper underestimates the complexity of this bug. And it goes more through about how it's reproduced, and this is very similar to what I see in academics, uh, in computer science in general, but specifically these CPU bugs, where they find something that has some level of signal, and then they go and they write a bunch of different uh, examples of using the bug with this signal uh, to attack different parts of the processor and it leaking different things. And I don't really care. If I, if I can get a 100% leak rate, I don't care if I can leak open SSL AES keys or de-randomize kernel ASLR or attack the Linux kernel or break virtualization or find stack canaries or break SGX enclaves. Because if I have 100% understanding and success rates of what's going on, it's just implied that I can do all of those. And so that's kind of what I'm looking for. I'm looking for exactly how this bug works, what was wrong in the processor, and how to pinpoint this. So, so far I've been zooming in more and more, and there've been a couple uh, a couple pocs that I've worked on so far that have had a 100% success rate, but they've been a little bit wider range than I want. What what I want, um, so we got to talk a little bit about caches to, to get to this point. Um, so uh, effectively, in your processor, you have these these caches, and they're and they're fundamental, and they're all over the place in the processor. Like here's L1 D cache, L2 cache. L3 cache out here. And these caches have different shapes and structures. In this case, this L1 data cache is 32 kilobytes in size. The cache lines are 64 bytes in size. And it is an eight-way associative cache. Uh, and that leaves, if you divide all of that away, that means there are 64 sets. So for each different axis that you perform, uh, your address will categorize you into a different set, one of those 64 buckets. And each of those 64 buckets has eight places where an address can be held. So um, in the case of the L1 cache, it's relatively simple. We know that, uh, let's grab a stream term. Uh, we know that the bits that are responsible for looking up the sets are, if we look in binary at an address, we have the bottom six bits. And six bits, if you're not familiar, 
uh, if I do 2 to the 6th, it's 64. So the bottom six bits of an address select the byte offset inside of the cache line, since the cache lines are 64 bytes in size. Now the next six bits, uh, bits 6 through 11, these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, these bits actually select, oops, uh, these bits actually select the set, the, the like, different groups in this L1 cache. Uh, and then beyond that, nothing really matters. At least it seems to be the case. We, we don't know for sure. Everything can kind of vary. Now, the way that these eight ways work is you have an address that has this shape. And let's say this is your address. This is, this is your, like, uh, address that you're translating right now, and you have these bits set. Now, by having eight-way associ associativity in a cache means that you can have collisions here. Uh, think of it like a hash table where you have multiple things that have the same set. Uh, so they have these same, these six bits are identical in multiple a uh, accesses that occur. Now, the eight ways of the cache basically allows uh, storage of things with collisions. So for example, you could have an address that has these two bits set up here, and you could have one with these two bits set, and one with like these bits set, and they would all find their different places in this eight-way cache. Now eventually, after performing eight unique loads, uh, or fills of those cache lines, you would eventually get to the point where it would have to start evicting some of these ways because it has no more slots available in the set. So it will typically do something called LRU, least recently used. It will try to figure out which line has not been used for the longest amount of time, the like least recently used. It's been the longest time since something has been accessed, and thus it will try to delete that entry, and then replace it with the new one. So the bug that we're looking at, this uh, cache out attack, effectively uses evictions of the L1 data cache. So by causing collisions in those sets, by causing all of the ways to fill up in a specific set that you're interested in targeting, that will end up forcing uh, an entry to get evicted. And when that gets evicted, a line fill buffer entry gets created. And so there is a CPU bug. Uh, in this case, this is um, uh, like Riddle uh, is one name for it, but also this like, uh, I kind of forgot what it, what it is now. I'm, I'm losing, my, losing my thought process. Uh, this uh, TSX forwarding, whatever I'm working on right now, I forgot the name because I haven't said the name in a long time now. Uh, the T, T, D, D, or whatever, whatever it is, TSX, oh, whatever. Anyways, effectively, there are a couple different known bugs that leak from these line fill buffers. And so the mitigation that Intel put in place and corresponding with different OSs, so, so working with them, uh, they found that the easiest mitigation for them to put in place was to clear the, the store buffers and forwarding buffers, which can be leaked with another CPU bug, these load buffers, which can be leaked with another CPU bug, load port buffers, which can be leaked with another CPU bug, and these line fill buffers, which can be leaked with another CPU bug. So this paper posits that uh, that mitigation is not sufficient because while all of these buffers get cleared out or zeroed out, uh, I think is the actual implementation Intel went with, you can still, since the L1 cache still has old values in it, um, the theory, and it's totally correct, it's, the paper is, is legitimate, uh, the theory is that you can evict entries from the L1 cache in a specific way that causes them to have line fill buffer entries created. Or you can go the other way and you can cause collisions in here, which then causes an entry to get evicted and then a future load comes through and it loads through this line fill buffer. So there are two different directions. There's a load direction by causing evictions here and there's a store direction by causing evictions and writing out the cache line through the LFBs. So at the moral, the moral of the story is we have a way of leaking these line fill buffers. And, it's re and this specific paper is related to causing L1 data activity to cause those line fill buffers to get created with 
privileged data. Uh, and so what I've been looking at right now has been relatively easy. Uh, I've been trying to just kind of replicate the results at a high level by evicting the shit out of the cache and causing more loads and stores to occur and then s observing these values in the line fill buffers. And that's so far what I've seen. But I am not comfortable until I understand very thoroughly how it works. What I would like, I would like to perform a single load on another thread that would cause an eviction, that would cause an LFB entry to get created that I then could leak. I would like to know precisely. I don't want it to be access eight lines. I don't want it to be access a thousand lines. I don't want it to be invalidate all caches. I want it to be as precise as if I perform this singular load, I can leak uh, and, and or I can create a line fill buffer entry that I can then leak. Um, so I'm doing that in my custom operating system, which is designed specifically for CPU research. Uh, this is something that, it's actually a relatively old kernel of mine now, it's about two years old, uh, actually maybe even more, maybe almost three years old, and I, this kernel was originally designed for some like high performance compute stuff that I did, uh, and because of that it has very little noise and it's pretty isolated from everything that's going on on the system. Uh, to make the performance properties more predictable, to make it easier to do optimizations, uh, to just cut down on some of the system noise that cuts into uh, performance. And lo and behold, I ended up getting into some of the CPU research stuff uh, a little bit right before Meltdown and Spectre came out publicly. Uh, and it turned out this operating system was an amazing environment to repurpose because it's very low noise and thus I'm able to do very, very precise measurements. Uh, I actually have a couple blogs that I go into it, so Sushi Roll is the name of the kernel, and that's what I talk about, and then uh, finally, there is uh, load port snooping, which is like a technique that I use with the kernel to, to kind of extract this information out. So anyways, that's kind of where we are now. I'm trying to get basically a perfect understanding of this bug and how it works. So, let me read through chat, because I haven't in a bit. Uh, I'll dust off my old Amiga, <laughs> so I get a safe and fast computer. This modern shit is broken. Uh, that, that's, that's honestly not a bad approach. Uh, was this why Intel had a bit better performance than the competition? They took some shortcuts. Uh, that is, yes, probably absolutely the case. Uh, I think that's what the conclusion kind of has been so far. Of course, it's hard to prove that, uh, but yeah, I think a lot of the shortcuts that they've took have been taking some pretty big uh, leaps and bounds with with what they're allowed to do. Um, it's mind blowing how shit uh, looks painfully obvious in hindsight can lurk around unfucked with for decades. Buffer overflows and stack fuckery in the late '80s, then mid '90s. This stuff, a lot of recent timing attacks. Oh yeah, it's. It's crazy. I mean, security is largely awareness and understanding and, and getting people to be looking in these spaces. Uh, and that's one thing that's so crazy is just you're, you're really standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, although security does kind of get torn down and built up every few years, um, it, it does seem like we're always behind by, by quite a large margin. Uh, maybe the reason it's not 100% success rate is that Intel doesn't want them to reveal all of it. Uh, I don't think anyone on this paper has any agreements with Intel, and thus I don't think they would hold back punches if they had them. Uh, obviously, yeah, there's there's chances that they have partnerships with Intel, and uh, this paper definitely would have been reviewed by Intel prior to publication, and Intel, like they could probably follow Intel's guidance, uh, I don't think that's the case because the just the style of the writing uh, seems to follow more of the we found something interesting, now let's talk about all the ramifications of this rather than understanding how that interesting thing works. Um, and I recognize that's what everyone's interested in. Uh, what I'm interested in is is very academic in the sense that I want to understand how these processors work 
very thoroughly. I want to have emulators that can predict exactly how things behave on real hardware, at least for like certain subsets of things. So understanding things to the percentages of a, a like couple percents or leaks here or there or leak rates in the like couple hundred or tens of kilobytes per second usually isn't sufficient for me. I want to know the theoretical absolute best you can do on hardware uh, with these attacks. Uh, and that's, that's really important to me. Uh, Intel has collaborated with them on a the paper. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. They probably have, like, they went through the, the disclosure process. Uh, but it, like, going through uh, disclosure, responsible disclosure, doesn't necessarily mean that you're restricted from talking about what you want to talk about. Uh, it's hard to say how much, how much they worked with Intel. If Intel started telling them things about how things actually worked, then yeah, they'd probably be restricted there. But I just, I just don't think that's the case. Um, but yeah, no, no, I, t I totally agree. It's already public since November. Uh, yeah, I mean, with like the zombie load kind of talks, because this is basically, uh, the next... The next stage of zombie load. It, it's just the zombie load uh, MDS bugs. But I don't know. The VRW issues are already in the zombie load paper. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this this paper also misses the ball on some of the, the mitigations. It like talks about how it can use this to attack a hypervisor. Uh, even though with the correct mitigations, this attack would not work against a hypervisor. Um, so I, I just, I just don't, I don't like when I see stuff like that. Uh, I, I, I typically am pretty skeptical of almost anything public that people put out, especially papers. Uh, you have a lot of people who are interested in, in the fame. There are a lot of people interested in getting their name out there. A lot of people who want publications so they get more funding. Uh, and sometimes they won't necessarily lie, but maybe they'll tell white lies. Like, they know that maybe the ramifications of something aren't so bad, but they'll blow it out of proportion. Or they know that mitigations affect certain things, but they'll kind of gloss over that and, and go back to talking about how critical these bugs are. Um, and, and I see a little bit of that in this paper. Uh, and and, I, and I, don't like, I don't like that. Oh, you found them? Nice, man. Hell yeah. May of 2019. Fuck yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if the authors of Zombie Load watched you? I am one of the authors of Zombie Load. I found one of the MDS vulnerabilities as well. <laughs> so I am I'm part of the cool kids club. First reporter of, of yeah, so I did MLPDS. That was the specific bug that I did back in the back in the day. Uh, I didn't do many of these other ones, but I did the load port sampling, which to this day is still my favorite bug. <laughs> we know. <laughs> we like your work. Hell yeah. I don't know. MLPDS is just it just is so reliable. Maybe it's just because I put a lot of time into it and I understand it thoroughly. Uh, but I've just been able to do so many cool things with that. <laughs> and we join you during a work day on Twitch. <laughs> I mean, tech I, I, I guess... I was going to say it's not my work day, but it, it totally is. It's noon at this point. It's been... Uh, oh, God. It's been that long. Nine hours? That's it? Ah. Yeah, it's not even a long stream yet. This fits in one YouTube video. Okay, so back back to where we were. Let's see. Uh, let's see what we have for issues here. Okay, so what were we trying last? Let's do some undos. Okay, we were trying to figure out a way that we could time this access to determine if an eviction was actually happening on this uh, value, and I don't. Ah, uh, I just. Uh, I guess. If it's getting evicted to L2, 
this time axis is actually not going to be accurate to what I'm interested in. So this print's going to be too spewy, I think. So let's just do a uh, time sleep. Hopefully that. I'm going to see what this is. Okay, those look pretty L1 timey, at least on this machine. Because uh, I think I'd have to get that print out to not overlap, but it looks like it's... Yeah, it's always going to overlap. Uh, I'm going to just say that that's probably 92 and 94, and 214 and 306. So basically anything in the like 90 to probably 110 ballpark is probably... L1 and these look like they're an L1, but it's gonna be hard to say. I'm gonna say uh, Let's say if time access is greater than 120 print uh, interesting And I don't know if that'll actually be the case, but we'll see So someone who's seeing someone else's CPU uh, kind of workflows how different is this from the way you guys tackle problems? I know I, I'm just kind of solo. I don't have a group, so I probably do things a lot faster and looser. Not faster in terms of, like, getting to the conclusion faster, but, like, trying things rapidly and making mistakes. Because uh, I, don't, I don't have a group to sit down and, and talk through uh, what I'm trying to figure out. So uh, I'm kind of just YOLOing it, to be honest. But that's honestly how I learn. I still am uh, skeptical that I'm evicting these lines. Uh, whoops, I probably should print this out if I added this. So let's see. That, hmm, 120. I do have hyper-threading. Wow, they're right in the 120 ballpark. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's hard to conclude whether that's being evicted or not. I'm going to try writes. I'm going to do write volatile. If that gets evicted, I don't think I'm seeing signal with writes. And if I'm not seeing signal with writes, then there aren't evictions occurring. So I feel like I'm getting that leak through another channel, and I, I'm not quite sure what it is. I don't know if TAA can leak through other things other than the... Um, other than those fill buffers, but that seems to be what I'm seeing because I would expect if there are evictions, I would see these writes. So let's try. Uh, we're writing C0. I'm going to try and evict. Uh, actually, if I do write back and validate caches, that should cause those leaked values to go out. Um, and I'm looking for C0 now. Because I'm writing C0. So, if I see leaks here, which I don't, but I also haven't been seeing leaks with this variant, this new variant that I wrote, uh, when I do write back and validate caches. And, I, and I'm not sure why. I don't know why that's hurting the leaks. It's very strange. I am seeing leaks here. Without writing back caches, I'm seeing leaks of C0. So if I write out C1, how are those getting evicted? Yeah. I mean, this is definitely, these are definitely the values we're seeing. How on earth are those getting evicted? Because they, they have to be. I'm performing writes. I just I don't I don't understand where the the noise is here that would cause those to be getting evicted. Unless there's like really weird interactions here and that's kind of what I'm starting to speculate. I'm I'm starting to think that for some reason there are I feel like L1 cache sets are getting evicted that aren't supposed to be getting evicted. And, and I, I, I don't know why. Let me get rid of the mfence. Um, 
It's really strange. Really strange. Like, how, how am I leaking those values? And let me try C1. Um, are there other ways to create line fill buffer entries that are, like, unknown that I'm running into? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely that entry that I'm hitting. Um, let me see what I got for perf counters here. Let's see if I can get LFB, uh, hits. I need to see... I need to get some better introspection into this. So, source, uh, perf counters. Let's take a look at LFB. Hit LFB. Mem loads retired that hit LFB. Um... Yeah, let's see what we can do. I forget how to use my performance counter library, but let's uh, let's try this. So we're gonna do let me perf counters is equal to actually I'll call this PMCs. It's equal to uh, create perf counter performance counters init. That should create the subsystem, and then I should be able to register an event. Uh, PMCs dot register. Uh, oh, that's register resolve. And I'm gonna resolve. What is this? Ooh, L one D replacement would be good as well. I think that's how I do the syntax. Oh shit! Someone killed my monk. Someone fucking killed my monk. Well. I guess I will go kill that dude later today. <laughs> huh. I didn't see him walk by. All right. Anyways, uh, L1D replacement, I think, is how I resolve that. And then I can uh, read fix, disable all, set fix counter value, set interrupts, enable counters. Uh, set enable, enable. I think that's what I want. Let's do pmcs.clear zero. pmcs.enable zero. Uh, and then the resolve from this, I think, should do the trick. I don't know. I don't remember how I wrote this API. Read a perf counter just takes an ID. Clearing. That's straightforward. Enabling, I think, have... I have it clearing it, so resolving it. I'm guessing resolving will give the bits, yeah, for sure. Someone walking by again. All right, uh, associated function. Oh, yeah, that makes sense, because enable uh, has no reason. This is, uh, let's pull in this crate, actually. We'll do uh, use this. Okay. Performance counters init, and then performance. Oops. Performance counters enable zero with the L and D replacement and clear. Also, probably yeah. Performance counters clear zero. Which I think is, yeah, I already have that built in. So enable L1D replacement. Let's see. L1D replacement might not be something that's 100% supported on this processor. I'm not 100% sure. Let's take a look. Uh, we'll put some prints. Uh, we'll put a print here. Print L1D replacement and performance counters read zero. Let's see if that counts. Maybe it's going to be a huge number. Maybe we're going to see a lot of replacements, which would be kind of cool. Holy shit! What is causing those? Okay, I'm going to halt this uh, thread. I'm going to halt the hyper thread. What is causing the massive L1D replacements? 
Okay, cool. There's a bunch of L&D replacements. Uh, let's make sure. I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to keep that there. I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to put a print here. And I'm going to do like loop. And we're going to see how many L&D replacements we get in a loop with a uh, time sleep one second. So we're going to sleep one second between prints. And I hope to see almost no replacements here. Uh, there shouldn't be any reason that there are massive amounts of replacement. 0, 20, 30, 37. That sounds totally reasonable. OK. And let's try it here. Let's turn on this thread and see how many L&D replacements we get here. Almost none. Exactly what I would expect. There shouldn't be L&D replacements. Uh, with that thread running. OK, so we're going to halt that thread once again. And now I'm going to try to determine where these L1D replacements are coming from. So we've got this print that we can add. And I can just keep commenting out parts of the loop more and more. So I'm going to get rid of the seal flushes. Uh, I'm getting rid of the whole pock. <laughs> so throw the pock in the trash. And let's see what we get for L&D replacements. OK, a couple, but not very many. So let's add the CL flushes in. Something is causing massive amounts of L&D replacements. And I have no idea what it is or how. Wow. I, I mean, I guess maybe I'm just doing that many CL flushes. Uh, I'm not touching that RSI again, am I? RSI plus zero. I mean, I'm doing a C. Uh, I guess. Yeah, these numbers are almost the same. OK, that makes sense. So in this case, I'm not seeing it because I'm not timing it. This one I will see. So this one, I'll see a lot of L1D replacements. It is good to know that this counter is working as I want. And there we go. So these two numbers are going to be almost identical, because this is the number of iterations, and then that is the, uh, the counters we get. I can't believe someone killed my monk. Dude, they're so dead, man. They are so dead. OK. Let's do this. And. Oh, maybe I killed, I probably killed my own monk. That's probably what happened. Because I did get a skill up, so I might actually be strong enough to kill my own monk now. That's probably what happened. OK. So we got those L1D replacements. We shouldn't get any more on RDI, because we shouldn't be doing L1D replacements through there. Five sixty-two. OK, so it lines up with the iteration count. Um, and then. Finally, let's bring everything back, and let's see if that still lines up, if these two numbers are still approximately the same, which they should be. And they're not. This is about three times higher. It's about three times higher. Why would that be the case? Uh, I'm going to comment out some of these loads. I'm going to comment out those two on the inside and see what that does. And this should be kind of back to where we were. This just leaves the x begin, x end, the TSX region. OK, this looks good. So then I'm going to do this one. And there we go. That's doubled it. The L1D replacements. RDI, I mean, that is flushed. So I guess that makes sense. So that should double it. So now it should be double. And then this one uh, will cause this zero case to get realized, which will then triple it. OK, that makes sense. So those are all of the L1 evictions I'm seeing. So this number should be basically exactly 3x. Uh, so then I can get rid of this halt, and it should still maintain about 3x. 
Um, and yeah, it's still it's still about that three X number. Unless I'm counting my numbers wrong here, and I'm not. Uh, it's actually a little bit less. It's almost 2x. Yeah, so I don't quite know why those things are uh, somehow coming through. Yeah, I have no idea. They're, they're somehow coming through the uh, LFBs. So let's take a look at our hit LFB for Memload Retired. Uh, and there might be better counters that we can look at as well, but this one's probably going to be pretty good. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to hack this one in here. Uh, right here. L1D replacement. We're going to call this, uh, mem load retired hit LFB. Okay. So we're going to see if we're actually leaking this from the LFB by taking a look, uh, at the values there. So... Okay, here we have a bunch of LFB hits. We actually have LFB hits basically at the exact same rate, uh, which is fantastic. That's exactly what I want to see. Uh, so I'm going to halt this core, and then hopefully this drops to zero. Um, and I think I have this loop limited. No, I don't. That's interesting that it stopped. Okay, let's take a look. Oh. So all of these loads are filling from the LFBs. I know it says L1D replacement, but this is LFB hits. Loads are tiring from LFB hits. Uh, so what I can do is I can go and I can determine whether or not this is coming from an LFB. And we're going to get to the really hard question of how the fuck is an LFB entry getting created for these uh, lines? Okay, here we go. We're seeing LFB hits still. I don't know how. Now we have none of those loads. Okay, I'm starting to question whether or not this LFB counter is accurate. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this whole assembly block. And we shouldn't be hitting anything from LFBs anymore. Or they should be extremely rare. Uh, this is zero, mute, whatever. Okay, uh, is that just the amount of loads we have? I need to perform one load. Oh, I've got a couple loads going on here. Interesting, I'll comment out these. We're gonna try and figure out what's hitting LFBs. And maybe it's not what we expect. Uh, something's hitting LFBs here. Are these seal flushes? Are these seal flushes somehow? That makes no sense. It really makes no sense. Why would those be hitting LFBs? Okay, and let's do some normal loads. Move, racks, RSP. I think I have racks as a clobber, I do. Okay, so now we have a bunch of normal loads. Those seal flushes are doing something really weird to the system. Yeah. Like, very rarely are we, are we hitting those LFBs. So let's look at the first seal flush. Nothing. Okay. And the next one. Now we're hitting them. Those LFB entry hits are happening due to the access of this timing right here. This is causing those. So getting rid of that load, I think, will cause these LFB hits to disappear. And they do. That means I also can enable that seal flush. And now we're just not doing the X begin, X end. And we're going to see the same thing, I think. Yep. So timing this, how is that coming from that LFB? Oh, is it because I don't have an M fence here? So let's check this out. 
Uh, so this should have massive amounts of LFB hits, and I think that's because it was just cleared, and that's going to go through the LFB on that read. Uh, if I do an M fence here, I think that should cause the... Uh, no, that's still going to hit through the LFB. I think I understand what's happening now. Yeah. So since that load is not in caches, uh, this is actually going to cause an LFB entry to get created as this value whizzes all the way by. Um, and that makes sense. So that's I guess that's filling directly from the LFB, even though that's kind of interesting. I, I guess that makes sense. Um, L3 hits, UOPS, TXMIM, L1D replacements. So we saw those. DTLB load misses. I want to see, I guess in the case of writes, uh, do we have that core halted? We do. Let's see if we get more LFB hits than we would expect. Oh, yep, that was a mistake. I got to reboot quick. Tried to boot the kernel while it was like writing out the file. Okay, power control, reset server, here we go. Thank you everyone for the follows. That is so cool, man. We got the offsets here. Writing X to P. Um, got those at that offset. We're writing those. I just, I don't, I don't know how those are ending up in LFBs. I really don't. I, it's strange. Uh, are you running your custom kernel on a ded dedicated machine? Yes. Yeah, I'm net booting from, from Linux here. Okay. Something really weird is going on. I'm going to up the size of these comparisons. Just so we can have a little bit more confidence. I'm going to do a... Uh, let's do a... I need a random number. Uh, Python import random hex random dot rand in zero to the honestly 32 is going to be fine here. Actually, I want to do 64 because I can. This is going to be our secret. Move RBX secret. Compare racks with RBX. So we're going to look for a perfect comparison with that secret. So I want, we're going to load that secret in RBX. We're going to perform the leak. I'm going to then see if the leak byte matches this secret value, or the leaked whole quad word at this point matches the value. If it does, then we're going to mark this. So now we have a much more unique value that we're looking for, rather than the CEO, because there's a chance that maybe there's some noise and we see that. OK. So we're not seeing any signal, which is great. I wouldn't expect any signal. And then here, I'm going to do a pointer uh, as mute u64. And we're going to write out that value in a loop. And we're going to see if we see our signal. And we do. So it's, yeah. And if I were to change these to different values, we will no longer see the signal. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, no more signal. So like that is definitely the value. We are definitely leaking the value of those stores, uh, which is mind boggling to me because I have no idea where those are possibly coming from. Like this attack is apparently hitting L1. Uh, or I'm just starting to doubt whether this attack is actually hitting those LFBs. It, 
It's just strange. I, I don't know how LFB entries would be created for those stores, but they clearly are. Or this attack is not leaking LFBs. So either this attack is not leaking LFBs, which is news, That's that would be interesting, or the LFBs are getting created through not having to evict all those caches, which is also crazy. So something here is crazy. <laughs> Which is, hmm. Tom access to that. Uh, I have no idea. I have no idea how this is possibly working. <laughs> Flip this tail. Oh my god, yeah. I don't, I just don't get it. I mean, we haven't looked at the assembly yet to see exactly what's happening. So we can take a look. Uh, what's the issue? I have no idea. <laughs> that's, that's, that is the issue, is I don't understand what's happening right now at all. Uh, sushi roll. Let's take a look at N Disasm B64 uh, stage one dot flat. That should do the trick. Oops. And we'll do Vim dash. And we'll just search for oops. This value. Okay, why doesn't that exist? Oh, that's is that really the stage one? Yeah. I need the kernel, and this, uh, don't I flatten it to there? Uh, where's sushi roll kernel? Do I move that? No, I don't. Where is that? Sushi roll dot kern. Uh, bootloader, deploying bootloader. Oh, I, I have just a normal PE that I use for the kernel. I forgot. Uh, targets. There we go. Release. Okay, so there's the kernel. Uh, endosasm B64, kernel.exe. I'm hoping this will sync up just fine eventually. There we go. Okay. So here is... The code that we're actually running. So there's the X begin. Here's our attack. Uh, let's kind of compare it side by side with what we're doing. So we have a loop. We're tracking these failures. Um, okay, so we've got a couple things that are happening before. I need to find the end of the loop to figure out. So there's the M fence. Uh, here's the time access, RD, uh, RDTSC. Uh, shift left, yeah, that's getting the TSC value. Here, performing the loads. I actually need to fix that. Source, uh, CPU research, helpers. There sh this shouldn't be double loads. Okay, that's better. Um, M fence, RDTSC, then we do it, we subtract it, and then we compare that with R13. If we take a look, uh, R13 is, that's gonna be that threshold. So, uh, R13, Somewhere we'll get assigned here from racks from this call and that call happens way up here when we find the memory threshold So that's not part of it. So that's comparing uh, Let's see compare not carry with R13 So if it's not below then we are going to jump to this a7 ae which is here Otherwise, if it is below, then we're going to increment this uh, value on the stack, which is leaked. So RSP plus 70 is leaked. Uh, then we're going to do another RDTSC. This is to determine the print time. Uh, if it is not above, then we're going to jump to 79E0, and that's going to be the loop again. And then this is the printing stuff. So uh, 007, 
seven nine e zero. This is the start of the loop. That's all we're doing. There's nothing else happening on this processor. Um. So I'm confused as to. Yeah, I'm I'm really confused as to how how in this tiny amount of code. We've got how many loads? We've got a uh, store to the stack. That's incrementing the loop counter. Uh, we've got two reads from the stack that are getting the addresses for these uh, fields. Then we have our code verbatim. Uh, we, have a, we have our access, our timing access. We have a uh, update of the failure case on the stack. We have a right here on the stack. And then this is only executed if it's been a second. So this happens so rarely that this doesn't matter for our, our, our case. I, I don't understand how this would be causing enough evictions uh, to cause these writes to have LFB entries created. Uh, there's, something, there's something we're missing. What do you expect and what do you get? Uh, what I'm expecting is that I should have no signal because I'm not evicting enough cache lines to cause these entries to get evicted to L2 cache, which would cause these LFB entries to get created. Uh, so what that means is that somehow these writes... There, there's some interaction here that's causing these writes to have LFB entries created. Um, and it... I mean, I can try it. Let me try a different address. Here we go. This will be in a different cache set. Uh, yeah, there we go. Now it's in a completely different cache set, and we're going to write to a different cache set. Let's see if we still get leaks. And we do. So I don't, I don't understand how this, like, quote-unquote random cache set, I'm still seeing these, these value get. These values get leaked. Um, it it really kind of makes no sense, unless the current understanding in the community of how LFB entries get created is incorrect. So let's go to the Intel manual and let's check out the uh, optimization manual and see if we can get some nuggets. You have cache pressure and you don't understand why. Yes. Eff effectively. And I don't think I have cache press pressure. That's what's really mind-boggling, is for some reason, it's behaving as if there's cache pressure, but to my knowledge, there is none at all. Oops, I made another rat on accident. That's fine. That's... Tack, tack, and killing these rats. Okay. Um. Wait, people actually read the manual? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's the only way, man. Okay, so we're gonna look for LFB. L1 Dcash can main, uh, maintain up to 64 load micro ops from allocation until retirement. It can maintain up to 36 store operations from allocation until store value is committed back to the cache uh, or written to line fill buffers in the case of non-temporal stores. So potentially those are being treated as non-temporal. 10 entries. Um, LND misses is equal to that. Uh, hit LFBPS. Counts demand loads that uh, hits in a line fill buffer. Line fill buffer is allocated every time a miss occurs in the L1D cache. And that's going to happen in our attack. When a load hits uh, a location... When a load hits at this location, it means that a previous load store or hardware prefetch has already missed the L1D cache and a data fetch is in progress. Therefore, the cost of a hit in the L1, uh, the LFB varies. Okay. Is it prefetchers? Can the prefetcher cause LFB entries to get created? No, because I'm writing the same value over and over. That would make no sense. Um. Retired hit LFBs. Okay. 
36 store operations from allocation until the store value is committed to cash or written to LFBs in the case of non-temporal stores. And these are... Does the processor see that these values are never being read from that thread and determining that they're non-temporal and going directly out to cache or going directly out to memory? That is interesting. Um, let's see if my signal changes if I turn them into non-temporals. Uh, I don't know if Rust has an ability to do that. Uh, Rust up doc. Uh, temporal. I don't think so. I'm probably going to have to. Ooh, I can do. Nice. Non-temporal store. All right. Nightly only. Perfect. I'm all for it. Okay, we're going to switch these to non-temporal stores. Pointer as mute u64 and then this value and this should uh, this should roughly be the same but these will definitely create LFBs no signal oh is that not maybe these aren't aren't being written as volatile now Maybe these are being eliminated? No, that's, that wouldn't make sense for non-temporals. Our hypothesis uh, that the line fill buffer is not the only source of leakage is further backed uh, by observing performance counters. The FB hit and the L1 misperformance counters do not increase significantly. Uh, in contrast, the L1 hit performance counters shows multiple thousand L1 hits. Okay, so that's... Not the only source of the leakage. So then what is this attack that I'm seeing right now? <laughs> so those non-temporals don't work. This is really weird. But yeah, that makes sense. Because I would expect to see more more misses but yeah we're and what is the perf counter i'm tracking right now hit lfb i'm getting a lot of leaks without hitting the lfbs which is crazy What does Rush generate for non-temporal writes? I'm not sure. Uh, it should be a move NTA. Which I think is a AVX instruction. Can leaks lead to exploits? Uh, not really in this case. I mean, they can help assist in the exploitation of bugs, but you still need like an actual bug to go alongside of it. So, kind of? <laughs> I'll give that a kind of out of 10. Yeah, I don't know. This uh, this leak is coming from somewhere else, man. Either these LFB entries are getting created automatically, or there's a different source of, of leaks in this in this POC. Um, I don't really know where that could be coming from. Like, the seal flushes shouldn't be causing... I wonder... I wonder if seal flushes or, like, TSX regions have a chance... Like, this write volatile, this ends up everywhere, all over the systems. So this will end up... Uh, this will end up in the store buffers, it'll end up probably in these store ports. It'll end up going to L1 cache. Uh, it'll cause a TLB hit. Uh, it shouldn't cause an LFB entry to get created. But maybe, just maybe, uh, we're seeing like a store buffer get leaked during during this TSX thing. So we're, we're, we're filling up store buffers for sure. I can guarantee that. We're, 
We're jamming in store buffers. Uh, I guess maybe I'm not actually seeing LFBs. Maybe I'm seeing uh, store buffer forwarding. What was the store buffer forwarding attack? That was... Uh, was that part of MDS? Yeah, I think it was. Because it might be very similar. I might actually be forwarding those store buffers. In which case, I might have to make a different attack where I, like, intentionally delay. The problem is, all of the Intel bugs basically come from reading memory. Uh, so it's kind of hard to tell which bug is actually the source of your data. But I think there's a chance that these are actually coming from store forwarding. I thought leak uh, denotes data that can be inferred from something like a side channel attack. Yep, that is the case. So this could be used to steal like secrets and crypto keys and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, okay, so... Evicting previous cash lines from LD cash. So what's really interesting is Riddle, this paper, this, this is the new bug. This is cash out right here. After a while, these writes end up evicting the previous cache lines from the L1D cache. As these cache lines are dirty, the processor has to write them back through the memory hierarchy and will do, th do this through the LFB. <laughs> like, this is, this is the cache out paper mentioned in a, in a paper that's almost a year old now. Okay. Flush and reload. Blah, blah, blah. Concurrently written. Once we've leaked the value, use the techniques, uh, blah, 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 flush and reload. When seal flush is not, yep, to expose the desired data, yeah. Yep. Um, interesting. So... It's funny that volatile is used to prevent the compiler from caching, but non-temporal is used to prevent the CPU from caching. Yep. Yep. Um, let me actually see if these non-temporal stores are happening. Uh, okay. Yep, we're not seeing any of the leaks. And let's take a look at the code. Stream term. Uh, sushi roll. And let's find, yeah, we got to find this value. Uh, kernel target x86 release. Uh, and this has b64 kernel.exe. Uh, vim dash. Okay, yep, that's performing the non-temporals. I feel like I'm not leaking LFBs then. Because there's our loop. We just got a hot loop where we're just writing this out. Doing a non-temporal store of racks over and over and over in a loop. Uh, compiler's actually limiting it down only to one. So it is not treating that as a volatile store, which is interesting. Okay. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing that leak occur. So let's see what happens if I invalidate caches. This shouldn't have an effect because that should be causing an LFB entry to get created. You have to tell a compiler that non-temporal is volatile. Yeah, I don't need to do two loads, so I'm not too worried about it, but 
I would just inline I would just write it in assembly if I barely had to. Okay, so we have these going. Uh, what's our failure rate? Very, very rare. Almost no failures. Okay, let's uh, run this without validating caches. Okay, and now we have a, a lot of failures, and I can get rid of those failures. I think, uh, what was the trick here? I think I can do like a couple more of those flushes or something. Not quite. Let's do, uh, let's actually put this before. I think that drops the failure rate to zero. Nope, still failures. It's like 50% of the time there are failures. Ah, oh, that's that's really strange. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to an older commit, get status, get reset hard, and uh, we're back. Okay, so this is the previous attack that we were using, where we were histogramming the different values that we were leaking. And this one we had a little bit more success. So uh, this one we were seeing leaks that we kind of were expecting, and now I want to do the. Uh, so this one we're doing read volatile, and we're seeing the leaks occur, uh, and this one seems to line up a little bit better. So if I do, if I read from all of these different things, so I'm pulling in all of these different cache sets, and I'm printing the number of the cache sets, we see all these different values we leak. It's not the full complete set of uh, cache sets. So then when I come down here, if I add write back and validate uh, caches, then we do actually see all of these cache sets get leaked. And there they are. They're all here. So what I want to be able to do is have none of these cache sets getting leaked. And I don't really know how. Um, I could start adding delays. But effectively, I wouldn't expect to be leaking all of these different cache sets. Uh, they said that prefetchers might go through LFBs, right? The prefetcher might go through LFBs. That's what we saw in the manual, isn't it? Am I going crazy? Uh, Rent to LFBs. Maybe I saw it in another paper. Okay. Previous load store hardware prefetch has missed the LND cache. And the fetch is in progress. Okay. So that's not the case. Because there shouldn't be an LND miss in this case. What's interesting is that if, uh, flushing these caches does seem to show everything. So if I if I do this on page and let's go to page here, where do we go? Evict. Yes, there are evict buffer. So this will evict basically all of caches. Uh, actually, I think this is only 4K aligned, but for some reason this still has the effect of effectively being the same as clearing all caches. Now we do not see the uniform distribution here that we do uh, when we invalidate caches directly. Uh, let's see, because I think this one is uniform and instant. Yeah, this is much more uniform. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to evict I'm gonna go, I'm gonna step by 40. So now this will evict all of the different sets. So this should be roughly the same as evicting everything. And it's not. In fact, okay, there it is. I don't know why it takes time for it to behave differently. That That's very strange to me. I don't know. If it's uh, 
Is that because I did a write back and validate caches? I'm going to do a write back and validate caches outside of the loop. Just once. Just to make sure everything's reset. I want to reset the state of the processor effectively there. Okay, so there we almost immediately got this data. Now it's still not uniform. We see some of these some of these bins are a lot smaller than the others. And it's like a 50-50 split. And so what I would want would be the ability to change that. Now, I could potentially perform another load here, and that might change uh, but that would indicate that we're leaking things through load ports, if this is the case. And I'm not seeing everything. ED, only one hit. Okay, there it comes in. And now the others are filling in. Uh, okay, that's really strange. Let's, uh, I want a random chance of doing another load. I guess that might get forwarded past. The M fence killed it, right? If we do an M fence, this breaks it entirely. We got nothing. We got no leaks. Correct. We got no leaks. Uh, and if we do SI, I think if we do RDI, RSI, RSI, this one makes it work again. Something like that. Yup. You know, that was actually working right away. If I get rid of this M fence, do I still get everything working right away? Ah, uh, that took time. A couple seconds. Okay. So I'm going to put an M fence here. And we're going to see what that does. Oops, AFK too long. Do do do. Okay. Tag. So, hmm, I kind of expect this has, like, oops, that this has, like, an immediate effect, and it doesn't. Okay, and putting an M fence here does, though, unless I got lucky and that was a fluke. Yeah, that immediately works. Now, the frequencies are really low on these bins. Uh, now, why would an M fence there matter? Are these probe buffers not... We're going to do this and a delay of some time. There we go. Now we're not getting any leaks. Oh, we're getting fall throughs. We're always getting fall throughs. So that broke it. But getting rid of the delay? Really? And this works now? What? Okay, so that's we're we're learning things. We know that we know that a delay here, a register only loop actually affects the behaviors. Cool. Uh, I mean, that's not cool because it like is really confusing. What do you expect MFENS to do? I expect it to cause all the evictions to happen 
above. Okay, so now we're just seeing like random shit. I'm, I'm expecting it to cause all of these uh, things to end up retiring, all of the loads to end up retiring, and thus causing the evictions to occur prior to us actually sampling. Because otherwise there's a chance that we end up... Uh, there's a chance that we end up not actually having these loads complete and the flushes complete. Uh, I'm going to put an infant here as well. And so this, I thought this killed the signal before, but we'll see. Nope. That looks relatively healthy, unless this is just everything. No, these are like all, these are just like all values. So that's not good. That M fence causes leak sores, pages to get read. The pages are all zeroed out. So I don't really understand why that would happen. This is back to what I expect. Um, this actually looks really good. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Where do I have seven? Zero through seven. We have these leaks, and these leaks look look pretty healthy here. These C zeros, and beyond. And here they all are. They look good. Let's try to rebase them. I'm gonna rebase them. I'm gonna move them from C zero. I'm gonna put them at A zero, just to see how that affects things. I don't know if it will, but it might. <laughs> uh, A zero base and. There they fill in. And I think we have all the values now. F. Yeah, doesn't look like we're skipping anything. No patterns emerging. Uh, that's really weird because these loads should be causing... I mean, we can try what they were doing where they did the like move RCX... Uh, zero, and then a move racks RCX a couple times. But I don't think that is... That doesn't change it. Um... I guess we're seeing through C there, but I, I yeah I don't think that means anything in this case. Oops. Built there we go. I see I just I don't know why there's a delay I don't know why there's a hesitation is that is that like all the LFBs being randomly hit? Is that a desynchronization between the hyperthreads that causes us to be on different boundaries? Ah. Uh, I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Seal flush, RDI, RSI, RSI. And if I do just, uh, if I do none of these CL flushes, it doesn't work. Not interrupts. Yep, interrupts are cleared. Um, unless I enable interrupts. Boy, that would suck if I do, but I shouldn't. Uh, main... Interrupts init, but I don't think I ever enable them. Source uh, interrupts, uh, fn init. This sets up all the handlers. Init gdt. Interrupts enable, yeah, I don't have, I don't enable interrupts. So it's not that.
thought mfence was mostly about ordering. Well, it makes sure that uh, no load can start until the previous loads have been retired. And so it, it effectively allows those, uh, those loads to occur in like the correct order and kind of causes the previous loads to retire. It, it, it retire. It's kind of like a poor man's, uh, it's a relatively cheap way of doing like a synchronization barrier. Is it specified that the previous load must be retired? Um, I guess it's not necessarily retired. It's probably more, uh, no, I think it is retired actually. I think it is actually, because M fences are really expensive. I don't think it's an implementation detail. I think it requires retirement. Um, semantics says you can't share invalidation queues for loads. Okay, so we got rid of all the CL flushes and we're not seeing it work at all. And that makes sense because I need one of these CL flushes to be going through, which will then cause the TAA to occur. And what do we got? And there, everything fills in. I just don't know why it takes time. I don't know why it takes time to see those other values. And they all become visible at the same time, which is really confusing to me. It's like the processor decides to just start leaking different ways or leaking a different LFB entry. Maybe it's because I'm not changing the address on this at all. I don't know if that affects the LFB entry at all which LFB is selected. Um, what if I have RDI? Let's see, try and put that on a different. Now we get no leaks. Because it's, it's a different cache line than this. So I have to add 40 hex there. Wow. Um. That's really interesting. Why would that matter? Are you leaking exactly once? Yes. Although I can get two leaks per leak, depending on if it retries. I thought an elephant. Okay, so that's everything's working again. What? No, that's giving me all values, basically. What if I change the ordering on this? Thought an elephant to make sure the first load is completely performed before the second. And usually the implementation is flushing the local invalidation queue. I'm not sure exactly. Mm. This is just too fussy, man. TAA. This is a shit bug. It's just so hit or miss. I don't know. Well, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. I got to eat some food. I'm pretty hungry. Uh, 
But I will be kind of curious to uh, to look into this a little bit more. I just need to learn a little bit more about kind of like what's going on. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, I know it's just banging my head against the wall, but that is research. That is what's so beautiful about it. I really wish this paper had a little bit more descriptions of what's going on because they make it sound like they have it really reliable. Uh, I think they might have like system noise or some other thing or maybe they don't have this hot loop. Maybe this hot loop throws it off. And maybe I need a delay here. Maybe I need it to load and then wait and then load and, and whatever. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but either we're leaking f from not LFBs or the LFB entries are getting created uh, in a way that's uh, undocumented and, and we don't know about yet. So there's a lot of interesting things to kind of learn from there. But found many papers to be fr quite fragile. I mean, this paper, to be honest, the authors have probably no interest in like actually understanding exactly how these things work. They want to try and figure out different impacts and set up POC so they can get the biggest news article and the biggest hype and the biggest funding. Uh, and it's, it's just a different interest than I have in terms of understanding these things. So, but I, I'd like to see, what's interesting is this paper is like, yeah, paper's 12 pages, but I would say the only things I care about are like these 22 lines of code and like a couple mentions of like the cache sizes and that's it. Th those are like the only things that I find very relevant out of here. Everything else is just basically describing how CPU attacks work, which uh, is great to like refresh those things, but uh, something like this I think warrants a like 30 page paper where you actually really dig into and understand these things. So, cool. Well, thanks everyone for stopping by. Uh, I'm sure I'll learn something very quickly. I'll probably sleep on this and I'll probably have some uh, better ideas of what to do. So thanks everyone for tuning in. See y'all around.